Hello, welcome to the Franklin Roosevelt Presidential Library Annual Hudson Valley History Reading Festival. I'm Paul Sparrow. I'm the director here at the FDR Library. Uh, and this year we're doing our reading festival virtually, but we still have four terrific authors. Uh, I hope you'll enjoy their talks and you'll stay with us for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, this year's program is done in partnership with the Friends of the Poughkeepsie Library. So I'd like to start uh, by introducing uh, Stu Shinsky, who is representing our partner and is a board member uh, for the Friends of the Poughkeepsie Public Library. Stu is also a great guy and a longtime supporter of the FDA Library. And you may remember him from his many great years at the Poughkeepsie Journal. Uh, so Stu, take it away. Paul, thanks so much. It's such a pleasure to be back uh, in association with the library and and on behalf of the friends of the Poughkeepsie Public Library District, we are simply honored to support uh, the essential work that the library does. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about who we are um, down at the, the Friends of the Library District. Basically, we're a nonprofit, uh, totally volunteer organization, and we operate the Friends Bookstore. And that's on Boardman Road in Poughkeepsie, behind the Boardman Road branch of the library. And what we do, is we sell books and DVDs and CDs. And we've got a stock of 20,000 items at any given time. And all those products are very inexpensive, a dollar, $2, 50 cents. You can get stuff for a dime. And all that money, all of that money goes to support literacy and reading and the Poughkeepsie Public Library District. Now those books and those DVDs, I got to tell you, they come from folks like you. They are donated by the community. We don't go to Barnes and Nobles, buy stuff, and then resell it. No, this is all from the community. And what we are doing is we invest in programs like this, in other community programs, virtual and in person when those days return to us. Um, what, what we get out of this is just the satisfaction of helping people appreciate literacy, appreciating books, appreciating DVDs and CDs. And what we love to see is folks who come in and scoop up some books. We are open three days a week and we give what we like to call an escape. We give pleasure, we give an escape, and we do it all through the wonderful experience of reading. So we invite you to visit our website, which is pokelib.org slash book hyphen store. Again, that's P-O-K-L-I-B dot org forward slash book hyphen store we invite you to visit us we do sell books online as well if you're not able to visit us in the bookstore and we hope that when you want to escape with a good book you'll think of us and you'll come down maybe make a few purchases and support the public library district that we all love so much in this area thank you paul pleasure to be here thank you Stu. and um i should point out that uh uh, full disclosure, um, my wife, Maris, volunteers there at the bookstore for the public library. She was there just yesterday, and she there said bookshelves are filled with biographies and histories and gardening and cookbooks, and it's really fabulous. So keep up the great work there. We appreciate the support, and we love what you guys do as well. Thanks, too. All right, now let's get into this. Our first uh, author is Vincent T. D'Aquino, author of Patriot Hero of the Hudson Valley, The Life and Ride of Sybil Ludington. Now, Vin has written several books for children and adults, uh, including Hauntings of the Hudson River Valley, An Investigative Journey. For you Ghostbusters out there, it's a classic. Uh, Dequino takes, uh, also gives talks to teachers and historians at annual conferences, uh, local, state, and national level. He is presented at the BOCES Young Adult uh, conferences for more than 30 years, and he's conducted uh, a writer's workshop uh, for the Mahopic Library for more than 20 years. Uh, he was a teacher in Westchester County. Uh, he retired in 2007 and dedicates his time now to writing. Uh, he resides with his wife, June, in Mahopac, New York. Uh, and please welcome uh, Vincent, the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much. It is absolutely an honor to be part of this Hudson River History Reading Festival. Uh, I've said it many times and I'll say it again. If we do not teach the children of today about their yesterday, we are going to steal 
part of the opportunity of a better tomorrow for them. History is absolutely essential. We have to remember the people who came before us. And my first encounter with actually getting into history was with Sybil Ludington. And I saw a sign on my way to my sixth grade English class uh, that said that Sybil Ludington rode by this spot back in 1777 to help repel the British in Danbury, Connecticut with Colonel Henry Ludington. Now, I had no idea who Colonel Henry Ludington was. I had no idea what happened in Danbury, Connecticut. And so I began studying. And I realized something very, very important, that it's not the history of people that is so essential. It's their lives. Who were they in the time that they lived? And what does that have to do with who we are today? So the more I studied her, the more confusing it got, because I quickly discovered that many of the facts of Sybil's life weren't facts at all. As a matter of fact, her history became sort of distorted. And the more I studied, the more obvious it became. So for those of you who don't know Sybil Ludington and the importance of what she did in history, or at least one of the things she did in history, it goes like this. Sybil Ludington was the daughter of Colonel Henry Ludington. Now, Colonel Henry Ludington was a colonel of the militia. That means his men were volunteers. And they were off on their farms until something happened. Well, the American Revolution happened and happened in a big way. And it affected all of America. And it was a busy time for everyone, especially a colonel in the neutral territory. And Colonel Ludington was directly responsible for helping to repel not only the British, but the cowboys and the Skinners. And these were people who stole from the colonists and lives were in danger. So in the period of time that Sybil lived, now remember, Sybil was about 15 years old when this ride occurred. She was actually three weeks away uh, from her 16th birthday. When Sybil took this ride, that night she was at home with her father. Now that was a very unusual event because he was so busy out there fighting these cowboys and Skinners and British that he was seldom home. And for Sybil, this was a frightening thing. This man was so effective that there was a reward on his head. General Howe of the British Army wanted this man dead or alive. So every time the colonel went out to fight, he risked his life. And there was an opportunity for royalists and these bandits to kill him and perhaps send him home, draped over his horse, dead. Or shoot him through the window while he sat at dinner. So every time the colonel was not there was a time for Sybil to be worried. Well, on the night of the ride, Sybil most likely was at home sitting with her father, sitting by the fireplace. It was nine o'clock on a Sunday night. Since the men were militia, they were at their farms sleeping. The other seven siblings were asleep in their rooms. And all of a sudden, there were sounds of hooves a horse coming onto their property. Very unlikely, especially for that time, that time of night. Most likely, Sybil, her father and her mother went to the door, 
and heard a messenger come to the front door and pound on the door. Colonel said, who goes there? And a man's voice said, a messenger, sir. And he said, from whom? He said, Golcillic Silman, Benedict Arnold, who at that time was not yet a traitor, David Wooster, General David Wooster. Well, when the colonel heard those names, he most likely opened the door. And there stood a messenger, soaked from head to toe, dripping in rain. It was pouring outside. He came in. The colonel said, why are you here? And he said, sir, General Tryon, the very general you served under when you served with the British Army, has marched through Connecticut with 2,000 men. He is terrifying the people of Connecticut. We need your men. And the colonel said, my men, my men are in their homes asleep. I have no one to send. Sybil, we believe, said, send me. Now we have to remember that this girl, this 16-year-old girl, was about to get on a horse and go 40 miles through the territory to help round up the colonel's men. What we believe is that it was very likely since she and her father also most likely went on rounds to these men's houses. Her father ran a grist mill, delivered grain to some of those men, and certainly had to go to those men's houses to give warning for other events that were happening. So it's most likely that Sybil was the only person who could have taken this ride. Well, she did mount the horse that night. She did go 40 miles. Now I ask you to keep this in mind. She went 40 miles, Paul Revere went 12. Paul Revere had two helpers, Sybil had none. Paul Revere went on a lovely evening in Boston. Sybil went through Mahopac, Mahopac Mines, Mahopac Falls, Stormville, in the pouring rain. There were no paved roads. This was a dangerous journey. If those cowboys, Skinners, or British saw her that night, they would have killed her. She went anyway. So she took this perilous journey, rode all night long, got home at daybreak. The colonel and his men then went off toward Danbury. By the time they were halfway there, they realized that General Tryon was no fool. He came up to Connecticut through one way, came back another way, and they had to cut him off after he left Danbury. Well, a battle ensued. And eventually, the British were chased back to their ships. At that time, the, uh, the Sybil's father and his men finally got to go back home. Now, is that the end of Sybil's heroic adventures? Not for me. For me, it was the beginning. Because after I heard this, I was at first thrilled at the idea that we're finally celebrating a female hero of the Revolutionary War and a teenage female hero of the Revolutionary War. I was excited. So I began researching. I began studying history for the first time in my life, truly studying history and going in depth to find out not why she was a one night hero, but why and what in her nature made her a special kind of hero. So I began studying her. Lo and behold, 
strange things began to happen. For example, I read about her six children, four boys and two girls. She never had six children. I heard about her husband, Henry. His name wasn't Henry, who was a lawyer in Catskill, New York. He was not a lawyer in Catskill, New York. And I learned about her son, who was a hero in Kansas. Her son was not a hero in Kansas. And the more I studied, the more I realized history had made a mistake. Something happened. And her story was not being told as it really was lived. And I became more and more involved. In fact, I stayed involved for 20 years. And I stayed with this story because the more I learned about her, the more I appreciated the time she lived in, the difficulty of fighting for freedom in a new country, the difficulty of fighting one of the greatest armies, forces in the world, and defeating it. Our new fledgling country beat. England. It was an incredible time. It was also a time when you couldn't trust your neighbors. Some of them believed in the king. Some of them didn't. Some of them believed in this freedom. And there were uproars. And there were double crosses. And there were families against families. And it was a very difficult time to live. Well, as time went on for Sybil, difficulties didn't fade. She had a tough time and she was an incredible hero, but an incredible daughter who stayed by her mother's side until her mother had the 11th of her 12 children. Her mother and so helped to keep the farm up, helped to keep the grist mill going, helped to take care of all of those children. And her father deserves credit for being a great hero of the neutral territory. But who was manning the farm and the children while he was out doing his heroic deeds? So we sometimes forget the non-generals in our wars. We forget the common people who were not at all common. And Sybil was anything but common. She stayed with her mother until she was 23 years old. And she married a hero. Her husband, Edmund Ogden, fought on the bottom Richard with John Paul Jones. Every man on that ship was a hero. He served three times in the Revolutionary War. People hardly even knew his name. Now, in 1793, Sybil left her hometown. She left her father and her family because her husband believed and she believed that their lives would be enriched by moving to Catskill, New York, the next New York City. Well, as it turned out, that didn't happen. Steamships were going through there all the time. 24 taverns were running in the Catskill. They did run a tavern before they left this area. And they went there to make it. Unfortunately, in 1799, her husband died of yellow fever, got caught in an epidemic, leaving her a single mother. Now she had a 13 year old boy. She was a single mother. She had no real means of taking care of this kid. She opened a tavern. There were 24 taver taverns 
in that area at that time, one of them was run by a woman, Sybil. Something unheard of. She raised that child from the money that she made at the tavern. What did he become? He became a lawyer and a New York State Assemblyman. As a single mother, she made sure that kid was not only raised, but raised correctly. And he married. And he had a child. She sold the tavern. And she went off to Unadilla, New York with her son and his son, Edmund Augustus Ogden. Edmund Augustus Ogden, her grandson, went to, can we guess? She helped him raise his six children. The oldest went to West Point. Sadly, he fought courageously in several of the wars at the time. He was at Fort Riley in Kansas when cholera broke out. He was 44 years old. He got cholera and he died leaving his six children. Now I tell you all of this because I want you to understand the value of history. I want you to understand what I finally understood. History is made from lives. People who struggled in the history of their time, much the way someday people are going to talk about these people in history who went through a thing where they had to actually wear masks to go out into the public. This whole idea, this pandemic, will be talked about for many years to come. We cannot forget all of the individuals who are being affected at this very moment by what is happening in our time. And so we can't forget in this moment what happened in Sybil's time. Yes, I do want Sybil Ludington to be remembered for her famous ride, but I also want her to be remembered for the daughter that she was, for the wife that she was, for the daughter-in-law that she was. Everything we do in history will be forgotten unless we remember it. So for 20 years, I thought I had it made. I straightened out her story Help people understand that Sybil Ludington did not have six children. She had one boy, Henry. That one boy had six children. What happened? And that son was a lawyer, not her husband. What happened was simple. In a history book, it said that Sybil Ludington, the oldest child of Colonel Ludington, married Henry. Ogden. She did not. And when people finally discovered that she should be and was a hero, by studying historic documentation, letters, we were able to straighten out the story once and for all. Now, I thought I had done it. And then 20 years later, I went to the internet, only to discover that many of the things that I had already straightened out were not straightened out at all. They were being repeated over and over again. I was at wit's end. I didn't know what to do because, again, I felt that Sybil was being cheated out of her right to be known for who she was in the time that she lived. So I began studying again and it got worse because then what happened was there were things in the internet that said, and by the way, Sybil Ludington never really even took this ride. And I said, what? And they said, prove it. Show me 
documentation from the time of the ride proving that Sybil did, in fact, take the ride. Well, there isn't. Now, I'm not going to tell you that I didn't find things that were quite convincing, because I did. But actual letters from the time? I'm telling you, at that time, people were not documenting events such as Sybil's. And there was no proof that she took the ride, except for personal letters. We had personal letters. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we do. And those letters are in New York City as we speak. What happened was that I began studying and trying to find out what exactly happened at that time. And why people were saying that we didn't really have enough proof to prove her ride. Well, one thing they were saying was that the first mention of Sybil's ride was in 1907, when Willis Fletcher Johnson was paid by Luddington's to write a biography about Colonel Luddington. And in that book, it mentioned the ride. Well, fortunately, the DAR got wind of that and they fought for Sybil's rights and they helped put up signs along the way to show that she took this ride but people began to say that was 1907 she took the ride in 1777 we have nothing before then well as it turns out we did Martha Lamb a famous historian had written a book and in that book in 1880, it was a book about New York City. And in that book, she mentions the ride. Well, I was excited. I said, well, at least we have 1880. That helps. The only problem is Martha Lamb never gave credits for her research. And we don't know where she got the information. So naysayers again said, ah, doesn't count. So I went to the New York Historical uh, Library in New York City, and I searched Martha Lamb's research. Didn't find really anything convincing. And when I went to the director there and said, what I was looking for, he said, have you searched the Luddington family papers? And I said, Luddington family papers? And he said, yes, they were donated here by Jane Luddington. Well, unbelievable. There were letters in a box written by Sybil and to Sybil. Wonderful letters that helped us to understand who this woman was. And there was a letter from 1854 discussing the ride. I said, well, 1880? 1854, we're getting better. Then on further research, I saw that there was another letter from the sister of. Charles Luddington, who wrote a letter about her experience with Sybil's mother and Sybil, saying that Sybil herself told her the story of the ride. To make a long story longer, I started writing a new book called Patriot Hero of the Hudson Valley. My goal was to put as much of the information that I had gathered together to try to help people understand that history comes to us from many directions. It's hard enough to live life the first time, but to live a person's life after that person has been gone over 200 years is even more difficult. So a study of history can't just be a study of what other people might have said. What we have to do is roll up our sleeves 
and take a close look at what life was like before us. What exactly happened in a number of the events? And how did these people live? And who were these people really? So that is what motivated me to try to dig deeper. So when I put Patriot Hero of the Hudson Valley together, I would like to believe that I brought us closer to Sybil's story and brought us closer actually to Sybil and who she was and the difficulties that our country faced. Freedom is never free. And we had to work for it. This girl was living at a time when there were no grocery stores. They had to make their own clothes. They had to grow their own food, grind their own grain. It was a difficult time. So I hope I have brought for you a picture of a woman we need to learn about with the understanding that there are many women who struggled and lived difficult lives. And because they didn't wear badges, because they were not part of the army and could not be, was Sybil a soldier? Yes, in every way, but legally. <laughs> she was not allowed to be a soldier, yet she saved her husband, her father's life. And she went out in the night and risked her own life. There are so many people involved in every important incident in our American history. We must recognize all heroes of all ages, all genders, all nationalities, and all religions. Sybil Ludington is the kind of American we need to be proud of. She is the kind of American that our children need to know about. And we had to help our children understand that heroism comes in many ways, shapes, and form. Today, we are seeing heroism at its finest. Our nurses, our doctors, our storekeepers who know full well that going to work could be a deadly exercise, do it anyway. We need to understand what heroism truly means. And we need to appreciate all of the Americans who deserve to be on their pedestals for every reason possible. Thank you for joining us. And I know that you have questions. Please feel free to share those questions. Uh, I'm, I left a little more time for questions than, than I was asked to because uh, I want to make sure I've covered all my bases. So please. <laughs> well, I'll start uh, with oh, good. a question. Um, how well known was she at the time um, that it happened, or was it even at the time sort of blotted out? Her ride. We at the time, Sybil didn't even have any idea. Sybil died not knowing the importance of her ride. She died at seventy-seven years old. Years, sixty years after the event and never realized how important that ride was and risked her life without really looking back. She, it was something she knew she had to do and she did it. And so many other Americans did the same thing. But because we don't read about it at the time or maybe don't hear about it, doesn't mean it wasn't a heroic act. So now that we know through 
family sources that there was an event, we have to be careful not to say, well, it wasn't in the paper or uh, they didn't have surveillance cameras. So we don't know for sure that she actually took the ride. Sometimes we just have to believe and understand that perilous actions call for perilous reactions. And that's what it was. She went out and did what she believed she had to do. No one talked about it. Fortunately, we do have two letters, and those letters do exist, discussing it, not at the time of the ride, still a number of years later, but we do have a letter from someone who spoke to Sybil during her lifetime about the ride, takes us a little closer to understanding what she did that night. Any other questions? Uh, okay, I see a question here that says, you got to know the Ludington family eventually. Uh, tell us about that. Well, I have to tell you that I've gone to six family reunions and I'm finally called, fondly called, Cousin Vinny uh, because I've met so many of them and got to talk to them. What a fine bunch of people. Uh, the Luddingtons are incredible. They lived long lives. One of them became a governor. Uh, these are people who respected history and who were just extraordinary, ordinary people. And uh, I became very fond of them. Uh, and they still are very much around, all over. Um, one of the patriarchs of the family uh, is up in Canada. And uh, it's, you know, it's amazing. The, the new patriarch, Paul Luddington, is in England. And he, they have a, a website. And this family writes back and forth and shares information uh, to this day. Uh, deeds, documents of all sorts. Uh, it's, it's an incredible family. Any other questions? No, Arwen, for the next question. It's so important uh, that people understand that that old steamer trunk up in the attic that's full of old letters. Oh, yes. There could be treasures in there. There could be gold mines in there. And, and people have as these things have been passed down from generation to generation, they sort of lose track of what they are, uh, but they really are still uh, just thousands of letters out there from the Revolutionary War period, from the Civil War period, from World War I, World War II, especially during those periods when people were away from their homes and they would write letters back and forth and they present such a vivid and intimate portrait of what was happening I, in the world. They're a, a, a kind of history that we can all relate to. Um, and you know, I think your story just typifies how important it is to understand what the families have and how they came to be where they are today and, and to find ways to share them. Yeah, I have to tell you that the letters that I found that drove me to write Patriot, Patriot Hero of the Hudson Valley, those letters were in the bottom drawer of a filing cabinet of Jane Luddington. Now, I met Jane Ludington at one of the family reunions in New Haven, Connecticut. And when I went to the library to do my research, and he told me it was Jane Ludington, I said, wait a minute, I'm not sure. And it turns out that Jane Ludington was her middle name. And you're going to ask me what her first name is, and I can't remember it because I call her Jane also. But I contacted her and was amazed when she told me that the letters were being eaten by mice in this cabinet in the carriage house of a house that they had in Lyme, Connecticut, and in, in Old Lyme. And then she didn't know what to do with them, so she donated them to the library. These letters were incredible. A letter from Sybil herself to her brother explaining how her son died in front of her. 
and how fearful she was that she would have to reach out and close his eyes for him when he died. Beautiful, amazing letters, helping us to understand the human side of this woman. So please go through your attic, go through your basement, go to garage sales, buy those letters that they're, that they're selling for a nickel each. It's our history. And, and I would love to say his, our history is simple and easy. It isn't. It took me three years to uncover Sybil's true story. Three years. And still, 20 years later, I'm, I was still working to try to straighten it out. History is not simple. Living it the first time is hard enough. Unliving it or reliving it is even harder. Uh, another question down here. How can more school districts use her story, especially as an example for girls? Excellent question. I have, I just finished helping a young girl from Maryland who entered a history contest and she was doing research on Sybil Ludington. Well, I'm happy to say that research on Sybil has become a little easier because when I started 20 years ago, I did not have the advantage of the computer as it exists today. Today, you can go on and you could find amazing information. Retell her story. Sybil Ludington will, in fact, be dead unless we keep her alive. And that's true for all great historical figures. It is our duty to help to remember the past and the people who lived before us. Oh, another question here. Of all the interests that you have, why do you think you were so motivated in this ongoing search for Sybil's life? Was it love of family and country? Did you feel somehow you were led without question? And that's why I wrote the book, Hauntings of the Hudson River Valley, because not only Sybil, there were many people who should never be forgotten. Sybil has haunted me. I'm telling you, she has haunted me. And she has been a part of my life, trying to help me understand what I'm doing here and what I can contribute to people. I was a teacher for 35 years. One of the things that I learned as a teacher, it's not my job to teach children answers. It's my job to teach children questions, to have them constantly question the world they live in and try to find the answers that will help to make their lives enriched. Uh, another question, what is the best way to purchase your books? Oh, well, <laughs> go online to Amazon or go on to my website, which is www.vtdequino.com. Uh, when you do that, you could actually contact me. I would be more than happy to not only lead you to the books, but to talk with you in any group that you may have. My goal is to tell Sybil's story in as many ways as possible and to make sure she is never forgotten. I'm waiting for another question. Talk a little bit about the, your other book, The Hauntings of the Hudson Valley. Uh, is there one uh, ghost that there's one haunting other than Sybil? Oh, That's absolutely. Your, your favorite? George Denny was a 18-year-old boy who was hanged in Putnam County for a murder. He was accused of shotgunning an 80-year-old man. Well. There was circumstantial evidence, no witnesses. They tried this boy, and it was a hung jury. Within months, they retried him, and this time he was sentenced to hang. On the day of the execution, they brought that boy out of the front door of the courthouse, 
set him down on his own coffin and conducted his funeral while he was still alive. They marched him up and down the street, then took him behind the courthouse to hang him until he was dead. They cut him down, gave his body to his sister, who took the body away to an unknown, unmarked grave. Can you think of anyone better to be haunting us than this boy? He has been haunting me also for, since mm, 2008. He's still haunting me. I am working on a new book right now called Part Two, Hauntings of the Hudson River Valley. The incredibly extraordinary uh, Paranormal events that have occurred after that last book are amazing, unexplained. Are they uh, uh, just by chance? Not even close. This boy is speaking to me from beyond the same way Sybil has. I truly believe that these people are working through me to try to tell their story to help them cross over to be at peace. So George Denny is certainly one of those people that uh, can't let me go and I can't let him go. Uh, question. Do you think Sybil understood the importance at the time? No, she did not. She did what she thought she was supposed to be doing. She was a, a loyal daughter who did what she had to do. In one of the letters, her niece said she was acting as a soldier for her father. And in every way, she was. She was just doing what a good soldier does. And that's why I'm so proud of her. And that's why I don't want her ever to be forgotten. It doesn't matter if you're female or male, if you're a child, if you're old, if you're young, if you're black, if you're white, it is crucial that you get recognized for the hero that you are. Another question, the DAR helped in the beginning, but was on the other side later. What happened? Well, that's kind of a long story. Uh, the DAR did get her statue up on the pedestal. And the DAR was absolutely important in getting Sybil the recognition she deserved. However, the DAR has a very strict protocol. You do not just become a national patriot from hearsay. What the DAR believes is that some of the information we have from Sybil is information that did not come to us through military sources, through government sources, and therefore they cannot recognize it. So the DAR did not uh, and does not have Sybil down as a national patriot. Okay, how are we doing on time here? Uh, I think we're about gonna wrap it up. Um, and and I, 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 you're, when you said earlier, you know, I think historians are often uh, the people that give voice uh, to our ancestors. They give voice Absolutely. to the people of the past. And I think in this case, you have really uh, identified and elevated um, a person who deserves it. Um, it was one of those seminal moments in American history as the very identity of the colonies uh, was being transformed and the idea of independence, which was fairly radical, uh, in this small settlement in North America challenging the most powerful empire in the world. Uh, and yet uh, this woman, Sybil, she stood up and at the moment when it was most important, showed who she was and, and you have given her voice in a way that is just so important. And I think, you know, it's typical of, of a lot of history where the women's roles are downplayed uh, and the men's roles are emphasized and focused on. And so yep. I think it's terrific that you have 
done that for her and and given a great role model um, for for young women today and realize that you can change the world too. Absolutely, and and we can remember the world the way it was, and it's it, very important that we do that. Uh, okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I appreciate well, thank you. Your time today. I encourage everyone. I wish we were open so we could be selling your book in our bookstore. But when we do reopen, it will be there for anyone who's interested. Uh, we're going to take a short break. Uh, we will be back at uh, 2 o'clock for the second session in our uh, Hudson Valley History Reading Festival. We'll see you in a few minutes.